Welcome, everybody. We're so glad that you're able to join us for the Word of the Lord Conference for 2022. I believe now more than ever before, we need to have ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the churches. And so I believe if our heart is open and our ears are open, that God will speak clearly in this time. Why do we need the Word of the Lord? Because I believe the Word of the Lord brings life and the Word of the Lord brings breakthrough. And when we receive the Word of the Lord, you know what it does? It kind of does a divine adjustment on us, and it begins to give us God's perspectives. You know, there's a lot of voices. There's a lot of things that we can look at and focus on. Uh, But, you know, I believe if our eyes are upon the Lord and upon what his purposes are, then we will align and arise, and we will work with heaven to accomplish his purposes in the earth. I hope that's your heart. In fact, just agree with me right now. God, give us ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church in this time. You know, when the word of the Lord comes, it not just uh, informs us, but it also encourages us. But it not only encourages us, but it also begins to empower us so that we can get the download that God wants to bring so that we can be prepared and have the capacities that God wants us to have to be able to engage in the battle and win the way that God has called us to. And so I believe that is God's heart. I believe that is God's plan. And that's why we have the Word of the Lord Conference. You know, every season God is speaking. And we know that we heard in 2021 some things that are very key that we have utilized for that time. And I just want to say that whenever the Word of the Lord comes forth, it's never just compartmentalized or not just saying we're leaving one thing and going into another. No, what we're doing is adding to. What God has said before is still in force, and now we're adding to and saying this is what God wants to do in this season. So I hope you have your your minds open and your heart fortified to receive all the download that the Lord wants to bring. I believe we're living, you know, in unprecedented times. And in those unprecedented times, I believe we can believe for unprecedented breakthroughs. In fact, I believe God is saying that he's going to release breakthrough in 2022. And I want you to hear that word breakthrough because I believe it's so key and so important to accomplishing what God has in mind in this time. A lot of things may be speaking, it's time to break or, or break down or break up. But God says, no. I'm going to have a church that knows how to break through with me and receive the grace that he wants to bring. In fact, if you don't mind right now, as we start off this session together, just lift up your hands toward heaven. I love what the Apostle Paul many times would pray for the church, and he'd say this, let grace be multiplied. And I believe God wants to multiply your measure of faith, multiply your measure of grace, and bring increase to God's supply within your life. So, Lord, as we have our hands lifted up, We're praying for the multiplication exponentially of what you want to bring to us. We're praying, God, for the spirit of awakening and revival to begin to blow like the winds that begin to blow upon the valley of dry bones and cause the mighty army to arise. Let the ruach, the breath of the almighty, the wind of God begin to blow. Father, we want to receive the download from heaven that you have for us in this season. Let the awakening and revival that you've decreed now begin to take place as we agree with heaven in this time. You know, when uh, the disciples went and waited in the upper room, they didn't know exactly when everything would begin to shift and change and take place. Uh, But as they were faithful and they were seeking and they were waiting, what happened in that appointed time, a rushing, mighty, Mighty wind, a little bit of an atmosphere of heaven rushed into that room, and they received a download of the Holy Spirit upon their life that caused them to have great boldness and to bring breakthrough, even revival in a city and in a region by the word of the Lord. And so I believe that's the times that we're living in right now. Uh, I believe part of what the Lord is saying to us is that uh, in order to receive this breakthrough, we've got to know how uh, to press through the resistance that we're going to face. And in order to break through the resistance, there's going to take something called persistence. And I believe God's going to begin to cause us to understand how to have that kind of faith that not only moves mountains, but also knows how to climb mountains and knows how to endure. 
And I believe that if we have that kind of faith that says, I will stand, and having done all, I will stand, and no matter what takes place, I will not wilt, I will not wander, I will not retreat, but I will stand, then God will command the victory for each and every one of us. In fact, uh, just in agreement with that decree right now, maybe if somebody's close to you, give them a high five and say, I decree your victory. And if no one's with you right now, just decree. I decree my victory right now. Let it come out of your mouth because when you use your mouth, we know this is the decade of the pay, the mouth. When you use your mouth, it's the greatest gate that God ever gave to mankind. And when we use it rightly, it can change everything and anything. When we use it wrongly, we know life and death. Actually, it says death and life. So we're always tending toward death. But God says when we prophesy, when we speak the word of the Lord, it does bring life. And I believe that's what God's going to do as we share together today. Uh, I believe God's downloading right now into our system, if you will, just like a computer program, you know, gets that download that begins to give a preparation and a capacity for that program to work to cause great things to take place. That God's downloading some things right now into his ecclesia, the church. And uh, what the Lord said to me is something he's been saying in this season. He's releasing miracles, mantles, and inheritances. And so the miracles, you know, are always given for a purpose. They're always given to be able to advance the kingdom of God. And, you know, in an army front, when there's something that's needing to break through, all the power is really put on the front lines. And I think that's the truth, is that when we're willing to be on the front lines with God, we're going to see more miracles, more power demonstrations, because why? There's going to be more power encounters at that time. But God's downloading uh, that dunamis, miracle working power, into his ecclesia in this hour. He's also giving us fresh mantles. You know, if we're going to break through, we need the new. And I believe there's a new mantle that God wants to release upon his church. Remember uh, that uh, Elijah said to Elisha, if you can see me when I go, you can receive what? the double portion of my mantle. And so that's part of God's decree in this hour. See, the release of a mantle is very purposeful. It's not just to show off and say, hey, don't I look great? Oh, I'm uh, dressed up to uh, designer clothing. I've got, you know, Yahweh incorporated on today. No, it's not to show off. I got Elijah's mantle. No, it was to cause the purposes of that mantle to work. And so that's why uh, when Elisha received that double portion mantle, he immediately took it back to the place of the last miracle uh, that Elijah had done and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And he struck the waters. And what happened? The same miracle took place. That was a confirmation that God says, I am with you. Remember when he said to Joshua, Moses is dead, but I am with you. Maybe one thing is gone by the wayside. Maybe other things are behind you. Maybe there's even some grief, but God says, here's the peace and here's my presence and here's my power for you to be able to advance. And we know that Elisha did twice the miracles that Elijah had done. In fact, the first miracle he did was not just parting of the waters, but then he went into Jericho and he brought transformation into a city and into a region. He broke the spirit of death and barrenness and released the blessings and the waters from that time forward were heal. And so I believe God's wanting to heal our land, heal our heart, and help us in a powerful way in this hour. When you get a mantle, see, it's like a, a person you might know naturally down the street and call him Joe, but when you step into uh, the arena, perhaps he is uh, a lawyer that now has been raised up to be a judge, and you step into that courtroom and he's wearing a mantle or a robe, then the wisdom is not to just look at him as Joe that you know, but recognize there's a difference on him today. And he's representing more than himself. And so you say your honor and there's a positioning that God's giving to us and a power and a mantle that God wants to release. In fact, I believe in the prophetic, there's really kind of a triple fold anointing. The apostolic and the prophetic is given uh, to release the spirit of breakthrough, the spirit of restoration and the spirit of transformation. And I believe that's where we're living right now. And God's saying, I'm going to do the new, I'm going to bring a new mantle. 
upon my church, and we're going to be known as the ecclesia. That is that term that means a ruling class that knows how to use the keys of the kingdom and forbid and allow, and that we're going to operate with a new anointing. In fact, just lift up your hands right now. Father, I pray right now for every person watching that they will receive the mantle that you prepared for them. It will fit rightly. It will work rightly. It's the mantle of Jesus. When Jesus ascended, the Holy Spirit came down and empowered us to do the same that Jesus did and even greater works. And we loose that mantle upon every Christian, upon every believer, and upon everyone that wants to receive apostolic and prophetic grace in this hour for that release of breakthrough, that release of restoration, and that release of the ability to bring transformation into people, into cities and nations, into every place that we are sent. Receive that double portion, triple portion, if you will, anointing that God has for you in this hour. And then there's that issue of inheritances. And when you receive an inheritance, we know uh, that you get the land, you get the car, you get the estate, uh, you get the keys, you get the password, you get the account numbers, you get everything. And that's what Jesus did upon the cross of Calvary. He signed the bottom of the deed. He said, this is my will and my testimony. This is what I'm going to give to my church, those that follow after me. And I'm going to anoint them. I'm going to give them the inheritance that the Father has planned for each and every one. And when you get that, you get the keys to the kingdom. You get the keys to do what God has called you to. I mentioned this story uh, even in October. I want to just relay it quickly to you again. Uh, when we went over to uh, England several years ago, in fact, right at the beginning of our traveling ministry, my wife and I ended up in London, and we were traveling and working hard. We were going to and fro, uh, ministering the word of the Lord, going and ministering to some MPs in Parliament, and uh, just having a lot of favor and opportunities with prayer groups as well. And at the end of that time, we thought, well, We'd really like to be tourists for a moment, so we want to run over to uh, Westminster Abbey, and maybe we can have an opportunity to be able to see the Abbey and be uh, there for a moment before we go. And so we took the tube, we rushed across, we ended up uh, at the station there at Parliament. We went along the green there and the bushes and headed up to the front doors of Westminster Abbey. Just as we got there, we saw that the doors had been closed and locked, and they said, uh, we're closed for the night. Well, we were flying out in the morning, so we were a little discouraged and thought, oh, well, maybe we'll come again and maybe we'll have another opportunity. We've now been uh, to London, I don't know, probably 20 times, but at that time we weren't sure. So we were walking back toward Parliament just along the bushes there in the shade and the dark as it was starting to get uh, into evening time. And as we're walking, all of a sudden, this old guy, and we described him to you, uh, gray hair, kind of long, his teeth were not straight, kind of gnarly, kind of uh, yellow. Uh, he looked old and, and uh, a little gnarly in every way you could think. Uh, he stepped up right in front of us, and we were kind of startled, and, and he said, hey, what are you guys doing? And so I looked at my wife and kind of grabbed her and held her a little close and said, well, uh, you know, we, we came to see the Abbey, but the Abbey is closed. Oh, you wanted a tour, huh? I said, yeah, we did. So he said, well, where are you guys from? I said, well, well, you know, you can tell we're not from England. We're from America. He says, America? Oh, yeah. And we started to walk away. He said, wait, wait, where in America? I said, well, um, you know, Florida, the state of Florida. So, oh, yeah, I know Florida. So, okay. And we again thought we would go, but he stopped us again, kind of got in our way and said, well, where in Florida? And he said, uh, where in Florida are you guys from? And so we said, well, it's Santa Rosa Beach, a little town. I doubt you would even know it. He goes, Santa Rosa Beach? Really? I love Santa Rosa Beach. I just met somebody from Santa Rosa Beach. I said, you did? I said, yeah, I met this man, Tom Kinningham. And I thought, Tom Kinningham? I said, Tom Kinningham? Tom Kinningham is in our church. But I didn't know he was in London. I mean, he's just kind of a, uh, just a, a good old hick from the hills kind of guy here in Florida. And I thought, man, what's he doing in London? He said, yeah, I met him and I really liked him. He said, wow, well, wait here, guys. I've got something for you. And he put his hand behind his back. About that time, I grabbed my wife a little stronger. And he said, here, let me tell you something. And he, this is what I got for you. He pulled out, and he had this big ring of keys, and he shook it in our face, and he says, you're in luck today because I'm the curator of the Abbey. 
And we looked at him, looked at each other, says, if you want a tour, I'll take you on the tour of a lifetime. I'll take you into the back where the rooms that nobody gets to go to, where the kings and queens get dressed. I'll give you access to everything. I'll tell you what, I'll give you the tour that you could never have any other way. He says, come follow us. I looked at my wife and we prayed and kind of under our in tongues for a minute and said, okay. And sure enough, he was the curator and he took us on a tour that we could have never had any other way. Well, what am I saying to you? That God knows how to bring you the keys when you need access to what he wants to bring you into. So we were able to go back into those rooms that nobody got access to and pray and just agree for God's purposes to unfold for Great Britain and for all that God had in mind. And I believe it was a divine appointment for God's purposes to unfold. So what am I saying? God knows how to bring a divine appointment to you to get you the keys that you need at the appointed time. In fact, you remember in Acts 3 when the apostles were going through uh, the gate beautiful and the lame man cried out and he said, we don't have money for you, but we do have something and healed them at that moment. You know, that word beautiful is actually in the Greek, the word horeos, which actually comes from hora, which literally means the right hour, the perfect time. It's kind of like uh, the word kairos, right? The appointed time. And so I believe God has special keys for all of us in this season. In fact, my wife is sharing a message out of a dream that God gave to her about three specific keys, a gold key, a silver key, and a brass or ancient key, and what they mean. And I know that it will greatly bless you as you receive that download of revelation. But right now, I want to agree that God's got some keys for you as well. What kind of keys? I believe they are Keras and Kairos keys. Well, what's that mean? Well, Charis is the word in the Greek in the New Testament is translated grace. But you know what? It's also translated favor. And you know what? It's also translated gift. And so we talk about the charis of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We talk about the grace of God, which is God's abilities inside of us. And we talk about the favor of God upon our life. And I believe God wants to give you some charis keys and also some kairos moments and kairos keys. What's kairos? It's the appointed, beautiful, right time where God does a miracle, where God brings favor, where God opens a door that has not been opened before. In fact, I believe this time in the earth is going to be known as the time of the great unlocking. And so let's believe right now. In fact, just lift up your hands again. Let's agree. Father, I believe for the keys that everyone needs at the right time. There's going to be a messenger. There's going to be a download. There's going to be a blessing. There's going to be an ability that's going to be given to ones that are on the front lines that are doing the work of the kingdom, and they're going to receive keys. I decree you will receive the Keras and the Kairos keys at that right time, the gifts of God, the anointings of God, the blessings of God. A favor will be shown, and you'll have access to things you would not have had access to Otherwise, let's believe for the download that the Lord has promised to us to bring us into the new that we need to break through into. I'm reminded a lot right now uh, uh, out of Second Chronicles 20. We know the story we talked about in 2020, how important it was to believe uh, the Lord and be established and believe his prophets so that you can prosper. Well, it's interesting that that word prosper doesn't just mean to be blessed with prosperity. It does mean that. But it means so much more. It means that you will advance, you will break out, you will break into, and you know what? You will break through. So let's look at that story just for a moment. If you remember, Second Chronicles 20, uh, Jehoshaphat and the kingdom, you know, they're just doing their thing. And they wake up one morning and they are surrounded by three of their fiercest enemies. And their enemies have the upper hand. They definitely have more than uh, Israel does. They have the abilities to be able to do, it feels like, what they want to. Uh, in a few hours, something was going to happen. Either all of the people of God were going to be uh, killed or enslaved or become captives, or else they were going to have breakthrough. And so if you remember, uh, it says at the beginning of that chapter that as Jehoshaphat the king woke up, he looked and he saw the predicament. What was it? It was dark. It was bleak, it was desperate, and it felt hopeless. But, and it says this, and honestly, he says, his heart feared. The first 
attack and first response out of our heart when things are going wrong is a sense of panic. That's where we get pandemic, right? The enemy wants to bring a panic upon your life. But I'm telling you, after he feared, he didn't stay there in fear. The next thing it says that Jehoshaphat did is he gathered all the people from the young to the old, all of the nation and said, this is a time that we're going to fast, we're going to pray, and we're going to seek God's face. And they began to cry out to God. I believe, honestly, that's where we are living right now. They're in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of a lot of global threat against Christianity and against the purposes of God, we're living in a season where it looks like we're surrounded and the enemy has outnumbered us and outflanked us. And yet God's looking for some Jehoshaphats and some people that will say, I'm not going to stay in fear. I'm going to seek God's face. And then right after that, you know what he began to do? He began to make an appeal to heaven. That's also where we have been living. I hope you've heard uh, Apostle Dutch Sheet's message on appeal to heaven. I preached it so many different times out of Nehemiah 4. I believe we're living right there right now. But what Jehoshaphat did is he began to make an eloquent appeal to God. He said, God, uh, I need your help in this time more than ever before. This is what it says. I want to read just a little bit of it to you out of Second Chronicles 20 and verse 6. It says in Jehoshaphat gathered the people and said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Wow. You are not Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, listen, forever? He's saying, look, there's a covenant. And then he goes on to talk about the temple. And that's where we run to in times of need and and just went on and on making his case to God to say, God, this is why we believe that you want to save us. This is why we believe that you want to help us. This is why we believe you want to fight for us. That's what we do when we make an appeal. We say, we're going to take the covenant. We're going to take the president, uh, the the things that have happened and say, this is case law. And then we're going to add the new information and say, we're going to add that to our case to make our appeal. And when it's heard by the king, if the king agrees, everything can change. Well, they were facing impossible odds, but God had a bigger plan that day. And so listen to what it says here uh, about them seeking the face of the Lord. God, it's your covenant and it's forever. You have a plan for America. America shall be saved. It reminds me, if you remember in Acts chapter four, when the apostles were being threatened by the enemy and the enemy looked like he had all the power uh, to change laws and to change circumstances and to persecute and attack and threaten. It says in Acts chapter four and verse 24, uh, that they began to cry out to God. I love what it says here. It's just an amazing thing is that they actually went back into the old Testament and began to cry out using Psalms 2. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. You know, that's talking about an antichrist agenda. It's talking about those that are against God's purposes and against God's plans, the kings, the rulers, the the ones of this world that think that they have the upper hand and they can do whatever they want to, to the people, whatever they want to, to the people of God. But they cried out and prayed Psalms 2. If you remember Psalms 2, it says, hey, guys, hey, kings, hey, great ones, you should kiss the sun and make up because God says you are in his hand and you should get it right. And then they prayed this prayer as well in verse 29 of Acts 4. And it's kind of interesting. They're having this threat. These attacks are coming against them. People are literally being hurt. Some are dying. Some are imprisoned. And they know the reality. They're being commanded not to speak the truth, not to speak in the name of Jesus. And at that moment, they cry out. And you know what? They don't cry out for these kings to die. They don't cry out for all the laws to change. They don't cry out for all the circumstances to be 
automatically made right for them. Rather, this is what they cry out for. Now, Lord, look on these threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness that we may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. What did they pray for? God, we need more power. And we need more boldness. I believe we're going to break through into more power and more boldness. In fact, lift up your hands again. Father, I'm praying that all those watching right now, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, that no matter what threat, no, no matter what assignment of fear, no matter what the enemy has tried to do to come and say things are hopeless, I loose the power of breakthrough upon them now in this season. And I decree you're going to be bolder and you're going to have access to even more power and your authority will not be thwarted, but you will have the ability to use the keys of the kingdom and lock up the gates of hell and unlock the gates of heaven. We loose that new level now to each one in Jesus' name. And so it goes on to say uh, that they began to cry out to the Lord and God began to give himself to them in a way that they began to rise up in faith. Things were shaken, things were breaking loose, and then they were filled and ready to go forth boldly. Everything didn't change, they changed. And I think that's what God is saying today. In fact, I believe, as I had stated some in October, God's raising up a stand-up generation. And what I mean by that is that, like Daniel, when he was threatened, when they changed the laws to stop him from praying and stop him from being a man of God, that he said, I will not change, I'll stand up. And they threw him into the den of hungry lions, thinking he would be devoured. But God knew how to preserve, even when everything looked like he should have died. And you remember, he mentored these three Hebrew boys, and we call them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the truth of it is, uh, they were more akin to their Hebrew names, which is Azariah, Hananiah, and Mishael. And Hananiah and uh, Zechariah, uh, ha Azariah, Hananiah, and Mishael uh, stood when the music said, bow down to the image, when everything Pressure, peer pressure, everything was saying, if you don't, this is what will happen to you. But they had been mentored and saw what Daniel had done. And they said, you know what? Maybe God will use us. If we perish, we perish, but we're not bowing down. And because of that, God preserved them through the fire. And because of that, a whole nation received the testimony of who the living God is. And a nation was changed in a day. I believe God's raising up a stand-up generation. You're a part of that stand-up generation that's not going to bow down to the assignments of the Antichrist spirit in this hour, but you're going to know how to having done all to stand, and God's going to stand up with you and make a testimony out of your life. Father, we're praying for that kind of fortitude, that kind of strength, and that kind of heart to be in your ecclesia to bring the changes that need to take place in our hour of need. Second Chronicles 20 and verse 12 went on to say about Jehoshaphat and the people of God, O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that comes against us, neither do we know what to do. It can feel like that. God, we don't understand everything that's happening. We don't even know exactly how to make everything right. We don't even know how to pray sometimes, but look what they said. But our eyes are upon you. In other words, don't let your eyes get on the problem. Don't let your eyes get on the pandemic. Don't let your eyes get on all the threats. Don't let your eyes get on all the other releases of bad news that the enemy is trying to bring to you. Let your eyes be on the Lord. That's why the word of the Lord is so important because when our eyes are fixed and focused on the right things, we'll get God's perspective and operate the way God needs us to. And so they had created an atmosphere of praise, an atmosphere of faith. And in that atmosphere, the prophetic began to be loosed. I believe that's the ecclesia God needs. That's the church that God wants to release, a church that is apostolic and prophetic, a church that hears from heaven and speaks what God is 
decreeing. In fact, I believe God's bringing the church to a whole new level of clarity in the prophetic, a whole new level of purity, a whole new level of ability. In fact, just receive that. Father, we're breaking through into the new and the prophetic and the apostolic. Some have been operating for quite a long time. Others are new to this, but in what level you are, God's saying, let's go. Let's go to the next level. I loose that breakthrough anointing because in Jehoshaphat's day, uh, a young man named Jehaziel, speaking of that young prophetic generation, rose up and he said, you know what? I'm not afraid. I'm going to bring my proclamation that the Lord has brought to me. And he said, listen, all of you uh, Jew and Judah, all of you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and even you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord. Wow. This guy was bold. And this guy was willing to step up and put himself on the line. He says, do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. Isn't that what God said to Joshua? If you're going to take the land, just one thing, only don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. Dismayed means to be disheartened, to lose heart for the battle, to lose heart for God's purposes unfolding. Do not be afraid. Don't be dismayed. This was the word of the Lord. Because of this great multitude, because of this great pandemic, because of this assignment and threat against your life and family, for the battle is not yours, but it is God's. And then he gives them a strategy. Sometimes you've got to stop and just listen. God, what's the strategy? And says, stand still. He says, uh, this is the way the enemy is going to come. And you're going to have to go out and face him. Second Chronicles 20, verse 17. For you will not need to fight in this battle, but position yourself and stand still. That doesn't mean don't do anything. It means still yourself. That means keep your confidence. Don't be shaken. Don't allow the enemy to come and rob you of your courage. That's when you're discouraged, right? You're robbed of courage. Don't allow the enemy to have the upper hand. And see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. That's where we talked about last year. It's time to run to the battle. Don't let the battle come to you. You run to the battle. How? With the word of the Lord. And then uh, 2020, we lived through 2020, right? Believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe in his prophets and you shall what? Break through. The spirit of breakthrough will be upon you. And then they appointed praisers, right? And the praisers went out first. And then in Chapter 20, verse 22, 20, 22, what did he say? Now, when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord sent ambushments against the assignments of the enemy, the attack of hell. Father, I ask for a praising church to arise and a people that know how to go out by faith, believing your word is true in the beauty of holiness and decreeing your mercy endures forever and that, God, you got this and you're up to something and you know how to bring the breakthrough. Does it make sense naturally? No. Is it a supernatural release of God? Yes, God will fight for you. In other words, you can only fight so much and do so much in your own abilities, but God's saying, watch me. I'm going to do the things that are beyond what you could ever think. Uh, we talked about last year how it's really a season of crossing over and how when God spoke to the disciples to cross over, uh, a mighty storm arose and that the enemy knew that when Jesus and the disciples got to the other side, they were going to deal with this cruel, controlling, demonic, territorial spirit in this gathering that was controlling everything that was taking uh, place in that territory. And so he sent a demonic storm. They went to wake up Jesus that was asleep in the boat. Jesus rebuked the winds and the waves saying, what? Peace, be still. The God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. But then he looked at his disciples and he said, why are you afraid and where is your faith. And so, as I said last year, the Lord spoke and said, the real virus is not what we think. It's not this uh, COVID-19. It's really a demonic release from the gates of hell. And it is fear, fatigue, and fatalism. Why does the enemy release fear? Because fear is used to control a population or control a people. And that spirit of intimidation is real and it wants to control your life, but we're called to break through 
that spirit of fear. The spirit of fatigue can be real. I mean, I went through COVID-19 now twice uh, with Omicron as well. Uh, but here we are today decreeing that God's bringing strength and joy for the battle. Don't let the enemy rob your strength, rob your joy. No, get back in there with a smile on your face and say, there's grace for me. And I'm going to run the race that God has made for me. And then fatalism just tries to get you into that place where you shrug your shoulders and say, I think it's hopeless. I don't know what we can do. It's just the, the a sign of the times. We can't make a difference in this life. And the Lord says, no, you are my ecclesia. I've given you the keys of the kingdom and I'm counting on you to bring breakthrough. There is an antichrist agenda. There is an assignment of the enemy right now. This in full force that wants to bring uh, a globalism and a global uh, governance across the world that wants to do, if you will, the big reset that the enemy has planned in the Antichrist agenda. But I'm telling you, uh, there's also a Christ agenda, and God has a church that now must rise up and fight like never before and let God fight for us by positioning ourselves rightly the way God has asked. And so, you know, in order for there to be a global governance, the enemy has to bring about global crisis. So you could say climate change, you could say uh, a pandemic. I'm not saying these things aren't real, but I'm saying they're trying to be used. Maybe it's an alien invasion next. I don't know what the enemy wants to do globally to try to set the stage where uh, they think that they've got to take control. Uh, but I believe God's got a church that's going to counteract the assignments of hell. Even the two witnesses in the last days, uh, I believe the apostolic and the prophetic were used to do amazing things. So let's keep our mind and our heart right. The enemy uh, wants to bring about a global reset that has the Antichrist agenda in it. God wants to reset his church into that apostolic prophetic ecclesia understanding and anointing so that we know how to operate in this time to bring to pass God's purposes in the earth. Yes, we know that there'll be an antichrist religious uh, faction. There'll be a one world religion and uh, ungodly, unholy alliances and compromises that we're trying to say every way leads to God, universalism, uh, just do whatever you want and everybody connect and be happy and it'll all work fine. Uh, but that lie will not work against the elect and the church that knows what is right. And when we stand up, and our stand-up generation. It won't matter who's saying it and how many are saying it. We'll know what God wants to do. And we can bring the shift and the change in the earth that God has called us to. But the Lord said more than ever before, listen to me, persistence is key. You know, in Luke 11, when uh, the Lord's prayer was given, when the disciples were asking, well, uh, how do we pray? And, and the Lord said, well, let me give you a framework. And he started off uh, our Father with our, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then what? Let thy kingdom come. Let thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. In other words, I want you to superimpose heaven's blessings, heaven's release of grace, heaven's uh, culture, and heaven's life into the curse that's at work in the earth. I want you to bring my kingdom, and wherever you cast the devil out, my kingdom is. With, by the finger of God, you cast the devil out, the, uh, then the kingdom is come nigh unto you. And so that's the call upon the church, is to confront the systems of this world and the assignments that are there, empowered by demonic powers to rule and reign and control people and rob, kill, and destroy. And so the Lord's saying, I'm blessing my church. And so, you know, uh, praise God, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But immediately after the rest of the Lord's prayer, the next thing it goes into in Luke 11 is this, a parable. And the parable is about a man who late at night had a friend come and he needed to be able to feed him. And so he ran to his friend's house and he knocked on the door and he said, hey, can you give me some food and some provisions and things so I can take care of the need that I have in my home right now? And if you remember, the man was his friend, but he said, hey, look, I'm, a, I'm in bed. My kids are in bed. And everything's kind of shut up for the night. Uh, can you go away? Come back another time. And what happens? Well, you know, he thought, well, maybe, you know, he doesn't want to do it. So I'm just going to go away. No, that's not what the friend did. Here's the parable. The friend stood there and knocked and then knocked and then knocked and then knocked and then knocked and didn't stop knocking until the guy came to the door and said, okay, I'll give you whatever you want. And it says in the parable, he didn't come 
and answer his cry just because he was his friend, but because of his persistence. Now, why did God give that parable right after the Lord's Prayer? Well, we want his kingdom to come, his will to be done, and we want to see it in our earth, in our life. But God says it's going to take something. It's not just casually saying, well, God's will will be done. Whatever will be, will be. Or no. Are we supposed to knock and keep on knocking, keep on fighting, keep on asking, keep on petitioning, keep on making our appeal to heaven and agreeing with God until things change? Sometimes you've got to hang in there longer than you think you ought to. And if you do, there is a prize for those that endure to the end. And so in 2022, I believe there is a double portion that God wants to release. But how many know, even for Elisha, the double portion didn't come that easy. Remember, not only did he have to burn his bridges and follow uh, Elijah, but he also kind of got the cold shoulder from Elijah sometimes when he said, what have I done to you? When, you know, Elijah want, Elisha wanted to take care of some things or when he said, you got to follow me and see me. He said, why don't you just stay here a while? Sometimes you can get uh, some discouraging or resistance from ones that you don't even expect, and you've got to choose. Do I believe? Am I going to keep following, and am I going to keep knocking, and I'm going to be persistent? You know, the Lord said to me in this persistence process uh, that he wants you to understand God has a purpose in your pain. I know that's maybe not a word that all of you want to hear, but I know some of you have gone through some real pain. And the Lord's saying in this season, don't let grief win. Don't let your pain twist you or pervert your purpose. But understand, even in the midst of the things that you've walked through, God's going to release his hand. I mean, the story of Joseph is such a picture, and you see that in his father's house, wow, what did he have? Everything. He was favored. He got a coat of many colors, which speaks of the manifold wisdom of God that speaks of the gifts and the fruits of the Spirit. It speaks of the favor multiplied. And yet, in his father's house, he also suffered some pain. What was that? Betrayal, uh, people turning against him that should have been for him, people not celebrating him, people selling him down the river into a terrible circumstance. His pain seemingly was an awful circumstance that only could work against him. In Potiphar's house in Egypt, we know again he got favored. He was lifted up to a high place, but then Potiphar's wife wanted a little bit of him and said, either you do it with me in the Egyptian way or you're going to lose everything. The opportunity to compromise was so strong. He was there on his own. What was he going to do? But he said, I will not betray my master or my Lord who I serve. And because of that, it felt like the threats of the enemy, Potiphar's wife, came to pass. Potiphar believed the false accusations. And all of a sudden, he found himself at the hand uh, uh, being dealt something that he never thought he would have to go through again. And he was thrust into the dungeon. And the dungeon uh, again, the coat of many colors was upon him. He immediately rose to the top, and it looked like, well, things are going to change because he interpreted the dreams. He went back into the prophetic. He was in the big house, if you will, and in the big house, he had his pain. What was his pain? Well, one, having to start over again. The pain was, am I forgotten? Because he interpreted the dream of the butler and the baker, and one got promoted and then seemingly forgot about him. But God had a Kairos moment, an appointed time when the Pharaoh had a dream and they remembered the gifting that was within Joseph. And he was brought from the prison to the prime minister's house. And even in that beautiful place where he was at the right hand of Pharaoh, there was another pain that he had. Didn't have anybody really to enjoy it with. His family was far from him. The ones that he loved were seemingly lost. But if you remember, God even redeemed that. What did he learn in his father's house? He learned about favor. What did he learn about in Potiphar's house? He learned about agriculture and how to run a great house. What did he learn about in the government prison of the dungeon? All about Pharaoh's house and what went on there and how to use his gift. And what did he learn about in Pharaoh's house? How to not only use his gift to preserve a nation, but also to restore his family, and even see some that had been lost come back to him again 
because he stayed in the right heart. He said, what you meant for evil has turned for my good. God's saying he always has a purpose in your pain. So whatever you walk through in this season, God says, persist, keep your heart, keep your eyes upon the Lord, because he is going to turn that which is seemingly meant for your evil. In fact, I'm praying for those that have gone through grief in this last time. And the Lord says, I'm pouring in the oil and the wine. I'm restoring your soul. I'm restoring your heart. I'm restoring your vision. I'm restoring those places where you felt like you had lost. And God says, I'm coming in and I'm going to show you some things that you have not seen. And I'm going to open your heart to look ahead with faith. And I'm going to put the coat of many colors back upon you again. God says he's restoring his church where we walk through things. He's perfecting us. He's releasing a passion through us. He's helping even to use what we were hurting in to be a compassion and a passion that's birthed inside of us to help others be comforted with the same comfort that we receive. And so receive that mantle as well. We're breaking through into compassion and into healing. In fact, uh, as we talked last year, uh, I'd never really done this before, but the Lord said, look up uh, the Hebrew and Greek words for 2021 in the Strong's Concordance. So I went ahead and did that. And I just want to read to you what those words were. Again, in uh, the Hebrew, it was the word hotson, and it meant to be strong, to be sharp as a weapon of war. In the Greek, it was a word epicurio, and it meant to take in your hand, to take to task, to undertake a mission. And what the Lord says is we're going to have to break through resistance in this season in order to fulfill our mission and fulfill our destiny. Don't think just because God's given you a mission, it's going to be easy. Don't think that you won't face resistance. God gave Joseph a dream, but he had some resistance. God gave uh, David a prophecy when he was young, but he had some resistance. God spoke to Moses and to a Joshua generation, but they had to fight to gain what God had promised in their life. And so you'll face resistance. And God says, this is a time to run to the battle and to be sharp, to be strong as a weapon of war and take it in your hand. In other words, take that weapon. What's the weapon? There's a weapon of praise, a weapon of prayer. There's a weapon of the prophetic. There's so many weapons that God's placed. The word of God is a weapon in our mouth. And so it says, take that weapon and put it in your hand and use it to be able to bring the breakthrough that God's decreed for you. Now, let me read to you what 2022, because I felt like the Lord said, it's okay, look at 2022 in Hebrew and Greek in the Strong's Concordance as well. And in the Hebrew, it's the word har, and it means mountain, hill, country, nation. And in the Greek, it's the word epikeo, which means to pour upon. Wow. I believe this is a season that God's going to pour out his spirit without measure. God has a harvest and an awakening. God has a reviving and an ability that he wants to bless us in this hour. The mountain of the church is going to rise up, the mountain of the kingdom, and see that outpouring. But you know what? We're going to touch the seven mountains or the mountains of culture in a unique and a powerful way. And I want to leave you with this because this is what the Lord said to me about this outpouring. Because it's interesting that the word uh, here in Greek is only used once in the New Testament. And it's found in Luke 10 in the story of what? The Good Samaritan. When he poured in the oil and the wine to the one that was broken on the side of the road. And if you remember as the story goes, that the Samaritan is not one that is liked or received uh, in Israel. Uh, There are uh, long-standing prejudices and bias. There are things that would divide and uh, things that would work against this story actually being fulfilled. And the priest walks by, and it seems like he should be the one to do the work that would help this man that is broken on the side of the road who had been harmed in such a terrible way, abused and used and robbed from and almost at death. And yet, what does he do? He looks, he sees, but he doesn't really see. He decides, I don't have time for this. It's inconvenient. This is not my mission. I'm going to just look back and go straight ahead. And that happens on several occasions. And yet the Samaritan is one that says, I'm going to stop 
and take the time, not only to pour in the oil and the wine that restores the soul or the body and makes them whole, but willing to pay the price to say whatever it takes to make it right, I'll do it. And I believe in this season, God's saying part of the resistance that the church will face is that assignment of a religious spirit that wants us to walk in pride, lose our compassion, lose our heart for a hurting world, lose our heart for the real mission. See, what the Lord said to me is that there's going to be opportunities for us to have big breakthroughs, but it's going to happen in a way that we will not expect. It will happen on the journey. It will be an interruption. It'll be something we didn't really ask for. We're going to say, but I have this that I need to do. And the Lord says, but wait, if you'll do this, greater things will take place. And uh, I'll watch this little uh, video from a girl, a little FedEx delivery girl, uh, who was doing her work, uh, going through all of her stops and making her deliveries. And this was just last week. And she's a Christian girl, a young girl, and really has been asking God, I want to be used of you. When she goes to this one house and makes her delivery and ends up making a little conversation as the lady uh, uh, was outside of her house and walking along as she carried in her package. And the lady ended up saying, you know, uh, you know, she said, well, how was your holidays? Oh, it was good. Da, 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 that's what the girl said. And then the other lady, yeah, well, how was yours? And she said, well, not good. My husband's been diagnosed with cancer and, and uh, it's really a desperate circumstance and I'm really hurting right now. And the Christian girl kind of thought, oh, well, that's bad, but I've got a lot to do. And so the truth of it is, she kind of said, well, I'm sorry for that, and kind of changed the subject and went on. She said she did about 20 stops, and the Lord arrested her along the way. She said, I got to go back. And she goes back, and she prays for that lady. And she said she never had received such a hug, and tears flowed from her eyes. And healing happened in her heart. I don't know if the man was raised up or not, but something took place of great grace that day. And this girl goes on to explain is how many times we're on point and task and think we got to do something. And we say, but I want to be used of you, God. And then God brings a divine interruption into our life. And sometimes we don't want to take the time. But I believe God's going to cause that story of the good Samaritan that we're going to pour out upon the mountains. We're going to pour out upon our country. We're going to pour out upon our nation. We're going to pour out upon the hurting that are on the sidelines of life right now that are broken down. So many are hurting right now and so many feel the pain of loss. But God says, we're the church. We're the greatest first responders the world has ever seen. We're the ones that are supposed to be on the scene first with the capacity to heal and make things right. Can I pray for you right now? I just want to agree for God's grace to flow. Do you feel the anointing? Do you feel the anointing right now? Lift up your hands, Father. We thank you right now. Lord, we're so busy so many times, so many agendas, so many things. We're trying to do your work. We want to be about our Father's business, but yet there are times you're putting things right in front of our face. At times, you're speaking to us in the circumstance that we're facing at that moment. We can't be focused just about what we think needs to get done. We got to listen and say, Lord, what do you want? Some of you are pastors and in the middle of your program, in the middle of your preaching, in the middle of your ministry, God's going to say, hey, this one needs. And I want you to break loose from the program that you have and let me do what I want to do. I remember one time my dad was actually frustrated with the Lord because he said, God, you don't ever give me specifics and you don't give me enough detail and I, I don't like this and I don't like that about how you uh, share with me in ministry. And so I'm just not going to minister tonight. I'm just going to preach and I'm going to quit because the prophetic wasn't received and he didn't, he heard of other people that had more specific things. So he said, ah, it's just, I don't want to do this anymore. But then at the end of the service, he felt this compunction to pray for somebody that was feeling hopeless, somebody that was really feeling broken. And uh, he just kind of stuffed it down and decided he wasn't going to. And then finally something broke and he said, I can't do this. And so he ended up ministering that word. And I want you to know later that night, a man came to him and said, you know what? I'd already bought the gun. I'd already decided to commit suicide. I decided I was gonna do it tonight 
but something told me to come to church and God would meet me. And he said, God met me. I said, God, you've got to speak to me or I won't believe. My dad in his hardness of heart, a frustration, would have said, I don't care. I'm not doing this tonight. What would have happened to that man? Father, we need you to show up in our lives. If we're going to break through, break our heart for the hurting. Open our heart with compassion. Cause us to be the ones that pour out the oil and the wine that restores the soul. The oil heals, the wine purifies, the bandage covers and cares. Let us do that. Even when we think that I've got to be here and do it now and I've got to keep going. You're saying, no, take the time. Stop now. Minister this way. Flow in the anointing. Pray for them. Hug them. Bless them. Speak to them. Encourage them. Text them. Lift them up before me. Father, let us be about your kingdom business, whatever it is. We're not going to be frustrated with divine interruptions. We're going to say, no, these are Kairos and Kairos and Kairos keys that you're given to us to minister with our giftedness in the appointed time to bring breakthrough. The Lord bless you.